Hello. Uh, I'm here to introduce a, a measurement tool for using in electronics labs and physics labs. And it works using Python. On the one side, you have Python, and you can use uh, commands to, uh, well, acquire data from the device. The architecture is the following. You have Python for all sorts of uh, data acquisition, uh, calibration, fitting analysis, and uh, everything that it can do, you know, like FFT or uh, any data extraction. And on the other side, you have a microcontroller that runs at 64 megahertz, and it does all your real-time data acquisition and uh, control and however, however which way you want to control an experiment. Okay, so we saw Srikant's efforts on uh, getting a laptop, an affordable laptop to schools. And what about laboratories? In laboratories, consider the average laboratory in, uh, say, a, a high school, an average electronic laboratory. Uh, what is the sort of equipment you would expect? Uh, you'd expect a multimeter at best. And uh, if it's a better funded lab, you'd expect, say, oscilloscopes and other tools. And the general procedure employed by students is that they take readings onto a notebook, say, and some of them might feed them to a computer and plot them or do further data analysis. With this setup, you skip that step. You have a tool which you can control with your programming languages. You have an entire set of functions for acquiring data. And OK, so what are the features? Starting with analog features, you have, uh, well, voltmeters, ammeters, and uh, they have various resolutions. And you also have function generators for uh, electronics experiments, like uh, signal mixing and, well, there are several digital features. Like, for example, if you're only concerned with uh, signals that are either logic high or logic low, like, for example, pulses between two events. For example, if you want to measure the speed of a projectile, uh, you have a light source, you'll have a light sensor, and when the projectile passes through the sensor, the light source is blocked momentarily. And when you measure the pulse width of the source, that actually you can calculate the speed of the projectile based on the width of the projectile. So you have four digital inputs for such um, applications. You have a four-channel logic analyzer. So what is a logic analyzer? Timer. So in a lab timer, you have a stopwatch that's running. And each time you press the lab button, the value on the stopwatch gets copied to a screen. So here, uh, instead of pressing the lab button, you the input is a digital signal. And each time the digital signal changes from high to low or low to high, uh, the value on the stopwatch is copied. And in this case, the stopwatch is a 64 megahertz clock, which means that the least count is 15 nanoseconds. And you can measure frequencies up to 64 megahertz, and you can generate several pulse width modulated signals. There are also several digital communication channels for various sensors. Like, for example, if you want to measure physical parameters, you have, let's say, a temperature, for example. There are analog sensors which convert temperature to a voltage value for which you'll use the analog section. There are digital sensors which will output digital values, like they'll use protocols like SPI or UART or I square C. All that is implemented. Then passive components like resistors, capacitors, inductors, uh, you can measure the values of all these. Other than that, well, standalone tools, power supplies, uh, and various standalone amplifiers. OK, so I've put together various GUI for uh, demonstration purposes. Here, for example, there are two traces. One is a square. Uh, both of them are square waves, and they're out of phase square waves. There's the red trace that's, uh, I don't remember the frequency, but you can see the time scale. And they're both 90 degree off phase. And the plotting tool that I've used is PyQt graph. And it's a fairly powerful tool for plotting. And it has inbuilt functionality for FFT and changing your axis, et cetera, to log scales and all. 
And here you can see the FFT spectrum for a square wave. It looks like that. And a square wave is made by overlapping sine frequencies. And that's the FFT for a square wave. Okay. So one main feature is that the it has a four channel oscilloscope which can run at one mega samples per second. So what is an oscilloscope? It basically a high speed voltmeter. So every second it can take millions of readings of voltages. And when you plot these as a function of time, you have an idea of how your voltage fluctuates as a function of time. So here, for example, of, I've used three channels. One of the channels I've connected to a sine wave generator, and the other two I've, uh, I've connected to uh, a communication channel, that is the uh, SPI channel. And SPI is what is used for uh, changing the analog gains. There are analog gain stages for the amplifier. So your net input range is plus minus 16 volts. And if you have smaller signals, there's an analog gain stage. And this analog gain stage is actually a chip which communicates via SPI. So I send it a digital signal to uh, change its gain. And the red trace and the yellow traces represent the signal that I'm sending to the, uh, to the analog amplifier. And as you can see, first I set the gain to be 1x for the channel on which I'd connected the sine wave. And then I say 2x, and you can see the signal that was sent. There's the clock pulses and there are data pulses. And the moment 2x reaches my analog stage, the sine wave actually becomes twice in amplitude. And this actually runs, it's, it's a non-blocking call. When you want to record traces, you can start recording traces. And in the meantime, you can do other operations like set digital outputs or read other values that are independent of the oscilloscope. Okay, uh, there are two waveform generators, sine waves or triangular waves. The minimum frequency is around 50 hertz, and it can go up to five kilohertz. So um, here, for example, uh, I've taken two of the, uh, these two sine waves and plotted a Lissajous plot. A Lissajous plot is actually an amplitude of uh, one curve versus the amplitude of the other. So if the phase difference between the curves are zero, you'll get an x is equal to y plot. And here, for example, uh, well, you get a figure like this. The frequencies are different, so you have multiple loops. Okay, so PyQT graph has built-in functionality for animating plots. You can have arrows to travel over the plots, and this is actually an animation of how the Lissajous is formed, the points on the curves that combine to give the point on the circle. Okay, so here's a simple electronics experiment. I took two of the sine waves with different frequencies and plotted them using the oscilloscope I connected to channel one and channel two. And I took a power spectrum. And as I can see, it's the frequency of the red trace is around, uh, well, this is in kilo units, so it's about 170. And the other is at about 800. And now, instead of connecting them to two independent channels, I used a pair of resistors to connect them to the same channel. So this effectively mixes the two signals together. And your channel now looks like this. But you can take an FFT and verify that the original components were indeed 170 hertz and around 800 hertz. And the amplitudes are different because the resistance values are different. So the mixing amplitudes are different. Okay, so I mentioned a four channel logic analyzer. So this is used for measuring again digital signals and precisely timing the values between them with a 15 nanosecond least count. Uh, this is again monitoring an SPI communication channel. You, what you saw with the oscilloscope was that its speed is limited to one megahertz, as in one mega samples per second, so you don't exactly get very clear pulses. But the logic analyzer, on the other hand, only records the points where pulses, the pulses change their logic level. And you can clearly interpret the data that is sent across. Uh, the uh, data is actually recorded as a one or a zero based on the clock's rising edge. The clock is the red trace and uh, the data is the yellow trace. And chip select is, well, for selecting which chip will receive the data. It's a parallel protocol. 
Okay. Here, for example, uh, this is the sort of signal that your TV remote sends out. It's actually semi-decoded. This TV remote sends out uh, pulsed IR signals. It's pulsed at around 30, 38 kilohertz. And there are on states and off states. And that's a, uh, this here is, a, is an IR sensor. I've powered it. It's a three-pin sensor. I've powered it. And the output is connected to the logic analyzer. And when you press a button on your TV remote, you see this sort of protocol. Uh, there's a start pulse and then so on. There are data bytes, address and data bytes. Right. Uh, you can also select which type of edges you want to see. You want to see the entire waveform or simply uh, when the logic changes from low to high or high to low, so on. Uh, All right, there are two phase correlated PWM waveforms. That is, uh, their frequencies can go up to 20 megahertz or so. And I can independently adjust the duty cycle of each waveform. These, these are used in motor control applications, by the way. And the phase difference between each waveform can also be controlled. Uh, here, for example, let's, I'm changing the high time of each of them, the duty cycle, basically. Okay, coming to sensors. This is a digital sensor to measure distance. What it does is it emits a bunch of sound pulses at 40 kilohertz, starts a timer, waits for the pulse to get back, and outputs a signal that looks like this. Here. So once I trigger it, and I ask it, or uh, trigger it, it's, I actually send it a voltage pulse on one pin. And once I trigger it, the output pin, uh, the logic level on the output goes high, and it only goes low once the sound pulse returns. So when you time the width of this pulse, that's actually twice the distance. Uh, and you can use the speed of sound to back calculate your distance. All right, there's an option to stream uh, your voltage values. That is, uh, the hardware will keep pushing your, uh, the whatever voltage values it reads at a maximum rate of 125 kilo samples to, uh, to the software. And PyQT graph is very effective at handling high speed streaming data. There are about 50,000 points here and every second I'm adding around 10,000 points to the plot. And uh, it's pretty fast when it comes to uh, scaling and panning and zooming and all that. Here's an example of a triple five timer in a stable mode. Some of you might have used a triple five timer. Uh, it actually creates an oscillating uh, digital signal at the output, that's pin number three, based on the ratios of resistances one, two, and the capacitor there. So uh, you've probably looked at the duty cycle and of the output pin, but what happens at points, the pin number seven and pin number two? Using the uh, four channel feature, you can connect one to well, the output pin, and the other two can be used to monitor the voltage levels at the capacitor, uh, pin number two, and the voltage levels between the two resistors. And, uh, okay, uh, it has, you can measure passive elements like capacitors, for example. Here, capacitor, the capacitances are measured using a constant current source. So the constant current source can be precisely turned on and off and for definite periods. So what is basically done is the capacitor is connected to a constant current source. You turn on the constant current source for a def definite time interval, turn it off and measure the voltage at the capacitor, across the capacitor. And from that you can back calculate your uh, capacitance based on your equations. Okay, uh, so now I'm wondering this has some potential to be used in labs. And so what can be done to take it forward? I'm open to suggestions. Uh, thank you. Yeah. As of now, well, Um, 
sorry what's yeah well if it goes into mass production electronic devices the cost scale changes dram dramatically depending this is handmade uh, what i have right now is hand soldered and uh, including component cost and prototyping costs it will cost around 10k more than 10k maybe but price will go down about to about half that if large quantities are made in machine processed sensors are all different, sensors are all different. whatever you have in the lab yeah. if you have analog sensors you can measure their value it says a measurement Okay. Uh, so it's it's a more powerful processor that's. They're actually using a very different uh, chipset. The core chip itself is itself different, and yeah, uh, they work on two uh, separate microcontrollers. X is an eight megahertz processor, and this is sixty four megahertz. It's a very few similar components. It's and yes, yeah. and uh, how is it different? Well, in terms of data throughput, it's works at 115 baud, 115k baud. This is one mega baud, so you can have much faster, like streaming data. I showed, and uh, as far there's a four-channel oscilloscope, and it's through simultaneous sampling, and uh, you can have four-channel, but it's, it's discrete values, and then the time scales are shifted and simultaneous. But uh, and the sampling rate is one mega samples per second. Also for analog signals, since uh, uh, I'm not sure, I have to ask. Sampling rate of XPice? Fifty power spec. Yeah. 
What is your question? Hmm. Yeah, they're actually a sign table. There's a waveform table that is loaded by an independent processor. So for the wave generators, is handled by PyQt cloud. Can I? Uh, no, uh, it will be calibrated. Eventually calibration values will be loaded in the uh, device itself. As of now, I'm using uh, standard calibration values. Of course, I'll be scaling the voltages down to whatever it ranges. Yeah. It will be calibrated. So, uh, yeah, I understand that there are a lot of people who are familiar with XPyce. So, there will be wrapper functions, of course. This software? Yeah, plotting tools, of course. I mean, they're tools. So, uh, actively port them back to this set of experiments. Let's put the other way. Can expect the implement around that. Because only one with the X5 is Yeah, that is a possibility. See, there's a hardware driving layer. Uh, that's a there's a driver library function that has functions to access the hardware. So if you change that driver uh, library, replace it with X spices, compatible functions, uh, compatible return types, only that level needs to be changed. The rest interface will remain the same. Only the communication library will change. Well, there's no more questions. I think you can wait for no more questions. 